He's just the nicest guy in the world and one of the most talented guys. Oh, love world, his stuff. Especially when it comes to documentaries. And uh, we are happy that the subject happens to be one so near and dear to this city. Our most famous, resi most famous resident ever, Mr. Benjamin Franklin, is yeah. the source of this. So uh, it premieres tonight, and it is also on tomorrow, 8 p.m. on PBS. It is a four-hour documentary. Please welcome Mr. Ken Bird. Yeah. Yeah. Morning, morning, morning. How you guys doing? It's been a while. I it has. It is good to see you as well. We're doing this via Zoom, but uh, but thanks so much for joining us again, Ken. It's always great to have you on. It's always great to be on. Thank you. Yeah, now we got one really super close to home, don't we? Wow. It, yeah. It's and Preston said so. You know, a near and dear, and obviously we, there's so much. It, you can't go anywhere in this city and not see. Obviously, this holds true for the country and for history. But in particular here, we almost feel like he's a he's a living uh, resident. You 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 know, he's always around you in mm. one form or another. Yeah, that's that's the key thing about Franklin. You hit the nail on the head. You know, he's accessible. He's not like. Uh, the other founding fathers, a kind of marble statuary that seemed fixed in their time. He's very accessible to us. He's a great writer, so he communicates that way. He's our original humorist. You know, there's so many things in our lives in which he's had an impact. Um, and he's the most important person in my mind, at least equal to George Washington, for our independence. And without his diplomacy, the greatest diplomat in American history, without his editing of the Declaration, without his forging of the compromises that created the Constitution, we don't have a country. And he's he's fluid. He's always trying to self-improve. He's always trying to get better. He, For a while, when he was a wealthy man and retired, he held some enslaved people as household uh, servants. And, you know, they, by the end of his life, he's leading an abolitionist society and proposing the abolition of slavery, you know, decades before most of the abolition movement got started in the 19th century. And he's funny, you know, he's oh. good and he's generous. Like he's on the hundred dollar bill. Everybody <laughs> wants more Benjamin. Right? <laughs> we're, missing, yeah. we're missing half of the equation because he bound it back to civic improvement. The why Franklin's on everything here is because he was interested in making the community better. Let's remember he was born in the Massachusetts Bay Colony as a little kid uh, broke out of an indentured servitude to come here to, to Philadelphia and died in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Yeah. He was as much interested in what we do together, the good we do together, as he did for uh, improving himself financially. I mean, all of his inventions, the lightning rod, the stove, the bifold, all of that are held without patent. He would have been a hundred times richer, but he understood that these were good for everybody. So he's the embodiment of the whole tension between what I want, personal freedom, and what we need, collective freedom. And he knew how to parse that. And that's why he's so great. And that's why he lives today. You know, it's interesting, uh, Ken, is that y y you... We're so, I think, in general, bereft of the belief that the people that we entrust are, whether they be the political elite or the people that we elect, that they, they have, you know, our best intentions at heart. That, that's a motivation. But you look at Ben Franklin and you look at, you said, you just reeled off a list of things that, that really does seem to be about someone looking to intercede on, you know, on behalf of the people. That's right. And, That's and right. a guy who is resolute in evolving himself, who could realize his own foibles and what he needed to improve upon. Th th that's exactly right. And so, he, you know, the problem today is not that the people aren't there that want to serve, is that we live in a binary media culture, computer culture. Everything's a one or a zero. Exactly. You know, you know for us, life is melodrama. Every villain is perfectly villainous. Every hero is perfectly virtuous until we discover that they've got a flaw and then we throw them out, right? It doesn't matter left, right, center. That's what happens. But what Franklin understood is that, you know, this is a tragedy. You know, people are complicated. He had, you know, he, he had strained relations in his family in lots of different ways. His son was the royal governor of New Jersey, stayed a loyalist, you know, was imprisoned during the revolution, got out, presumed he'd go to London. Instead, he stayed to start a terrorist organization killing patriots. Not that there weren't patriot organizations killing loyalists. Right. It was a big mess. But, you know, they never reconciled. He stayed away from his wife, Deborah, who stayed back and ran the family businesses for 15 out of the last 17 years. He knew that she had had a stroke, was dying, and wow. he wasn't there for her death. So, yeah, he's, he's complicated, but he has this desire to improve himself, and he makes all these lists of virtues that he tries to do, and, and yet 
he's, you know, he's, he's human like you and me. So he's recognizable. And I think our problem today is that we just, we, it's a, it's an on off switch and life isn't about that. You can't be married. You can't have kids. You can't be a friend without understanding. You're going to tolerate somebody else with flaws and that they themselves are tolerating your flaws. Well, it's often been said that you're, you're, you know, you're more interested in the imperfections. I think the imperfections are what makes someone human. I also think something that you've employed constantly throughout your years as, as a documentarian is the ability to judge people in their time to realize right. mm-hmm. that that you know some it's eventually there might be a finger pointing at you for what you for what you're not doing quite right that might not be suitable as things move along so realize that people in their time uh and, and i think ben franklin's one of the prime examples of somebody but he's exactly that who he's exactly this. that but he's speaking to us from that time and said look i could look at the limitations of the rest of the people around me of my time i mean jefferson writes the declaration that all men are created equal. You know, he wrote, here's the good part. He writes, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. Sends the first draft to Franklin. He goes, this is beautiful, Tom, beautiful, but let's make these truths self-evident. Uh-huh. We're in the age of enlightenment, right? right? Just like the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west. Let's make it self-evident. Let's not tie it to religion anymore. Let's just make it, this is scientific. This is the rights of human beings, you know? And so he you know, Jefferson never saw the hypocrisy or the contradiction. I made a film on him about owning slaves, but Franklin did. And he worked on that. And so he was able to transcend it. You know, in his will, he left some money uh, for for kids in his native Boston and in Philadelphia uh, to to go into the trades. And I, I talked to some folks from the Boston School, the Franklin Institute, and they were all, you know, young first generation immigrants or, um, uh, you know, lower uh, middle class folks right. that are striving to go to college for the first time. They were so filled with that energy that Franklin wanted Americans to have. It was just so beautiful that this gesture that this guy dying in 1790 makes that today in 20. 20- 22 there are people benefiting not just what we read about not just yeah. the documentaries that we watch but are benefiting from this endowment to say you matter if you work hard you can go someplace and there ought to be a place it happens to be the united states of america doesn't always work well where if you apply yourself we ought to be able to help you get along and it isn't you know it isn't just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's what the people think about Franklin, who loved the hundred dollar bill. That's why he's on the biggest right. denomination in general circulation. But they miss that other point that we are required to help each other. You know, Orwell makes a point in 1984 of talking about a, the um, a world that's just a constant present. There's no, there's no past. There's no, there's right. nothing to learn from. And 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 uh, and here is a case where. If you go back and visit, you know, what what you might think of someone. I love taking a dive into someone's best. And you've been the vessel for it, helping me do this and all of us do this over the years. The things that you learn and, and the more someone becomes a well-rounded, positive, negative kind of person, the more you can appreciate what they did. You, you'd mentioned Franklin's rules to live by. And you mentioned, you know, how he could have been, uh, you know, fabulously wealthy if he had patented some of these inventions. One of his rules is be extremely frugal. What was the right. one thing that Franklin couldn't be frugal about they just love too much to to not be a little audacious well you know what's so funny is john adams arrives a little bit late in paris franklin's been there for a while negotiating with the french and he knows how to handle the french adams has studied french language by reading by by memorizing funeral orations franklin's (laughs) learning to perfect his friends by writing love letters to the ladies Mm. so i think he just found in the high society of paris just a way in which oops a lot of those aphorisms a lot of those things that he had said you know early to bed you know and 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 adams goes there and he goes hey where's poor richard where's early to bed and early to rise (laughs) But but to, to Adam's great shock, Franklin had already negotiated two treaties. And just think about it. Washington had a big task not to lose a battle. Yeah, he wins at Trenton, but that's a surprise thing, and it's not this big of a deal. There is a victory at Saratoga, which allows Franklin to convince the, uh, the French that we're a viable, that we can win this thing. But when Cornwallis sur- uh, surrenders at Yorktown in 1781, Washington is there with about 9,000 Continental soldiers that are equipped and uniformed 
by the French. Thank you, Benjamin Franklin. Next to him are nearly the same amount of French soldiers. Thank you, Benjamin Franklin. And oh, by the way, Cornwallis can't escape and has to surrender because out in the harbor is a French fleet blocking the British retreat wow. back to New York. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. So all of this, you know, know him, know us is what I like to say. It's amazing. You know what, uh, Ken, we had, uh, Steve and I had received an award from uh, uh, the, the Masons here in Philadelphia, and we got invited to the Masonic <clears throat> Temple for a ceremony and, a, and an evening. And that place is just dripping with Ben Franklin. Of I mean, I, it was amazing to see his likeness all over the place. And, and it was at that point, I obviously I knew the legend of Ben, and I know the thumbnails version of his history, but how many things he had his hands in and yes. what and how he could uh how, how did he have enough time yes, yes. So, to, so to do he's, that he's so here's the key to him i think um and you'll see it in the film so his parents want him to go on a harvard tenure you know track uh, education but they can only afford a couple years elementary school early so he has two years of schooling so as um the writer hw brand says in our film he didn't know what he didn't have to know because school teaches you what you need to know but also what you don't need to know right right so he he figures out he has to learn everything so he's omnivorous he reads all the time he does all that when he gets to philadelphia and he's a printer and he's beginning to make it in the world he collects like-minded tradesmen the leather apron club it was called the junto meaning to join together and what comes out of this and his other civic stuff the free library of philadelphia the university of pennsylvania hospitals police forces volunteer fire departments uh, ideas on how to pave roads ideas on how to maintain street lights all of this stuff that is promoting a civic good at the same time he's improving himself and our problem today is that we're all independent free agents and it's just get what i can and yeah. i don't have to care about the other and it, this is not a left or right problem this is an american problem franklin points us the way to a kind of optimistic as you were saying present where you're filled with the past a lot of people say history repeats itself it never does mark twain who was the second humorist after you know, Franklin, Franklin said, fish and visitors stink after three days. <laughs> right, three right. people can keep mm -hmm. a secret if two of them are dead. Right. You know, this is, this <laughs> this is good like, stuff. This is great. He understands um, that human nature doesn't change. And so you're always up against the foibles of human nature, even when he is given the great honor of proposing the adoption of the Constitution in 1787 in Philadelphia. He says, look, we, when you assemble all these people with all their wisdom, you also gather their prejudices. And so you're not gonna make a perfect document and they don't. In order to keep the Southern states in so that we're not warring you know, states on the East Coast, they permit them to count their slaves as three-fifths of a person. It's a horrible compromise, but there wouldn't have been a United States without it. Can, and you uh, can Monday morning quarterback it, <laughs> and it's going to set in motion the Civil War, the worst event in American history, and Franklin knew it. But within a few months of his government getting started, the government that he helped forge, he sends in a resolution um, uh, suggesting that they outlaw slavery. Wow. Right. Great. Wow. When wow. you when you think about Ben Franklin, um, you, the two cities that come to mind are, are Boston and Philadelphia. And I want to know, Ken, why you think uh, Philadelphia is the better of those two cities. <laughs> oh, well, it's much better. Uh, you know, I, I tell you, so he grows up in Puritan Boston, right? The Cotton, the Ma Cotton Mather and the Mather family are the sort of the religious stuff and he's he's his family is um as i said kind of lower middle class they're candle makers they can't even afford to send him to school he apprentices indentured servant to his older brother james's print shop thank god for us and as a teenager he's learning to set type upside down and backwards he becomes hyper literate he's He's uh, submitting anonymous letters from an old widow that are hilarious and they're hugely popular and the paper takes off. And when his brother finds out about it, he gets jealous. So, you know, the things are good. He, he, he runs away. He is a runaway and comes to Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, founded by Quakers, a little bit more tolerant, 
a little bit more aware of native uh, uh, interests. All of the, these different cultures and religions are there, and he really imbibes it. You know, it's it's, and he manifests it. In fact, at his funeral, the largest gathering of people in the history of Philadelphia, at to that point, came together, and at the head were all the religious leaders of all the mm. denominations of all the religions present in Philadelphia, Muslim, Catholic, Jewish, Protestant, all the various Protestant sects. And it's, it's, it's a testament to the fact that he understood that at the heart of all religions is the idea that I need to do better for my fellow citizens. So, Ken, we've heard, I've heard him mentioned occasionally as the, Amer the closest that America will come to a da Vinci, to, to someone who is that, that, you know, that, 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 um, I mean, as you said, he, uh, just on a scientific level, he yeah, could let's go. You, go ahead. You, you, so, you know, um, my first, it's so funny that you said that I, I I'm friends with Walter Isaacson who wrote a wonderful biography of Ben and, and, and he's in our film along with lots of other people who've written biographies of him and scholars about him and stuff like that. But Walter also wrote a, a, a wonderful biography of Leonardo da Vinci. And so we're actually in the early stages of producing our first non-American topic on Leonardo. But let's go back and examine. Your question is so to the point. The thing that people don't remember is that when he becomes a revolutionary, he's 69 years old. He's got 15 years to go on this unbelievable life that spans most of the 18th century. Born in 1706, dies in 1790. This is an amazing, amazing life. Born, by the way, on the same day as Muhammad Ali, my last film. Mm -hmm. He may be the most amazing personality of the 20th century. Ben Franklin is without a doubt the most amazing American personality of the 18th century. But he is, he retires because he's made enough money enough money. He could be fabulously wealthy with the patents, but he's not. And to invent. And in his work with electricity, it's as important as Isaac Newton. I mean, he, if there were Nobel Prizes back then, he would have had it. He was the most famous American in the world, which is why we sent him to France, because the only person anybody on earth could name who came from America was Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> and let's just think about it. We just get distracted by the kite experiment. We think the lightning has to strike the kite. It doesn't. It, it He is proving principles that he got. It was parlor tricks about kissing people with static electricity. But now let's think about the names that we, I'm, I'm sure you're not an electrical engineer. I'm not. Right. But if I said to you positive and negative, charge, battery, and conductor, those five very easy to understand terms borrowed from other parts of our language, battery is a military term. These are all coined by Franklin hmm. so that the world, not just the scientific community, but everyone could begin to have a relationship with this mysterious force called electricity. He is, when he get, hmm. arrives in France, he's a cult hero. And what's he promoting with his little printing press? <laughs> democracy right. for the for these people who are subjects to King Louis the 16th it's just you can't make this stuff up and why it's so much better I think than fiction if you're just tuning in it's Ken Burns uh, who is uh, his special uh, the four-hour documentary Benjamin Franklin premieres tonight and tomorrow 8 p.m. on PBS can you, you know stream it you can stream it by the way once it goes out it's, okay. it's available for free on all the PBS platforms so Excellent. look at it when you want uh, you mentioned uh, the kite the uh, the lightning strike and and there there are myths that yes. surround sure. uh, yeah. uh, the, the amazing uh, individual that was known as Benjamin Franklin. Um, it, is that touched on in this stuff or is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think this is, you know, myths are like barnacles that attach themselves to the hull of the ship and impede the smooth sailing, mm. right? Yeah. It's just, you know, Washington, wooden teeth, no nope, <laughs> porcelain, never told a lie. Everybody lies. Threw a <laughs> coin across the Potomac, too wide. You know, I mean, <laughs> the Dodgers would hire him. <laughs> but I, I have it on good authority that Kim Jong Un has never gone to the bathroom. So, uh, well, yeah. that, that could that could right. Be. So right, I believe right. that That's, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he, he looks a little constipated, doesn't he? <laughs> Let me ask you again, because you're. you're you're uh, obviously now, and, and, now he's redirected the missiles. <laughs> to New That's right. They're coming right at us. Um, in the world of documentarians, is there a documentarian that you could see you turning your talents on who represents a, uh, a story worth telling? Because I, I, oh, what a wonderful question. What are you thinking about? I, you know, there, I don't know. I, you know, there's a great series that Seth Meyers does. It's a comedic take on some of the great documentaries like Nanook of the North and other the yes. classics 
And, and you know, I was wondering through your particular prism, is there anyone that jumps out at you that you yeah. think? You, you know what, a it's, a, it's a little bit biased. Nanook of the North is, is um, interesting and now deeply yeah. flawed because the anthropology of it, there are too yeah. many scenes set up. But it's Robert Flaherty who's considered the first American documentary uh, guy. And, and some of them are, 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 are terrific uh, films. I've got a friend, so this is completely biased, uh, who's uh, mainly known for his um, feature films, the German director, uh, Werner Herzog. Oh, he's and phenomenal. And we've been friends for 30 years, and he and I are the oddest couple on earth. You know, <laughs> I mean, we're, we've been friends, and our films couldn't be more different. But I, I adore him. He's, um, he's amazing. I just finished another film that'll be out in the fall in the U.S. and the Holocaust. And just by the way, whenever you want a really scary Nazi voice, I always go to Werner. <laughs> <laughs> I need your best Gestapo voice. <laughs> this quote by Goering is so bad that you just have to drip it with evil. Says, okay. You know, and then at one point he turns to me and says, he says, I am interested in, in a static truth. And my friend Ken here is interested in an emotional truth. You know, and it's like, That's he goes on and on. I, I'd like to just find, go to the depths of Werner's ecstatic truths. And he's done, he's done lots of documentaries lately. In fact, more documentaries recently than, than, than feature films. And um, I adore him. He's great. He's but brilliant. It's, I'm yeah. totally biased. Yeah. Ken, uh, I had dinner with my parents on Friday night and I told them that you were going to be on the show this morning. And uh, so my dad's first question, because we all watched uh, baseball together when we were growing up and, and so and it's just such a wonderful uh tribute to the to the history of the sport and the current sport uh and what it's become but my dad wanted me to ask you ken burns uh are the phillies going to win the nl east this year <laughs> <laughs> she is so funny you know i live uh within the radiational gravitational pull of boston because it, it isn't the boston red sox it's the new england red sox <laughs> so we've been i've been up here for 43 years and or more i've been up for more than 50 years and if we include some time in massachusetts so i've got that disease and whenever i'm asked i always say oh the, the red sox are going to win <laughs> this year. and i I can't concentrate on anyone else because I'm trying to hold up that, you know, house of cards. <laughs> Although we have won four world championships I know. I know. this millennium, <laughs> which, you know, like the last century, they 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 did four and then suddenly couldn't kind of connect for I think it's I think it's 86 years. Anyway. Yeah, just a brief pause. Well, yeah. Yeah. Just a just a slight little hiccup. Right? <laughs> Season starts soon. We'll see what happens. Well then, uh, Ken, it's a, it's always such a treat to talk to you. Thank you so much. And we're really excited about the fact yeah, that I can't you're focusing wait for you in on Ben. It. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't wait for you to see it. I think he's you'll just feel like, oh, I know this guy. He's yeah. real, you know. The yeah. past the past is not past. Uh, Faulkner says it it's now. And you just sort of feel like Oh, if you if you get at the 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 good and the bad of somebody, they feel like somebody you know. And I I made that mistake. I was talking to a reporter, and I said, you know, um, I've known him now for like five years. And she said, know him? And I said, oops, so oh, right, you know. <laughs> but I do, and I hope you know him too. At the end of this uh, two parter, we're Excellent. looking forward to it. Premieres today, and we'll be streaming everywhere that uh, PBS has uh, stuff available. So excellent, Ken. Thank you so much. Have a great one. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. I look forward to that. Thank you, guys. Have you a got good it. one. Ken Burns, yeah. guys. Something else. Man, I Just love great. talking Just to great. him. Just yep. great. Yeah. He, he, does his, uh, he does his research. He gets on board with things that, things that he's absolutely passionate about. Preston, imagine if most of your history teachers throughout school were like Ken Burns. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'd actually... Yeah. <laughs> you would have dialed in I'd a little listen, bit, right? Yeah. You know? And, and I wish I would have. You know, I, I, I look at some of the things. I remember when my kids uh, were entered into to middle school and I was helping them with their homework and... And uh, I started reading it. And I'm like, you know what? Now I finally find Mesopotamia fascinating. <laughs> yeah. When I was that age, I you could have, you know, I would have rather been punched in the face than read about this stuff. And now I actually care, uh, care about it. Yeah. So, uh, But when you do get a great teacher, when you get somebody who can explain things or a documentarian or somebody who's who's presenting this information and they do it in an entertaining way, it, it, it sets. It's really cool that that happens.